Today, I'm going to share with you eight grim stories about life in a psychiatric hospital. You'll hear about the vicinity of bloodshed, inhuman cruelty, and a genuine desire to help. Remember that real psychopaths are sometimes in white coats. Warning, the content is extremely violent. Let's go. It was October 23, 1967. I was working in the kitchen with some of the easier guys, the ones whose treatment was working. We lock up all of the knives and everything, obviously. I would get up each morning and pre-cut everything so we didn't have to get the knives out at all for anything. It took away a lot of flavor, but it was the safest thing to do for obvious reasons. That morning I got in and grabbed the knives out and began to do the prep work for the day. I was always alone in the kitchen, nothing seemed out of place at all. I went along whistling and talking to myself, then I went to pick up one of the paring knives, and I couldn't find it. It was in the set a minute ago, but now it wasn't. I figured I had dropped it, and began looking around for it. I could not find it. See when things go missing your mind instantly thinks of how you must have lost it you forget what you're doing or where you are and get annoyed with finding it. I did this, but then something said in my head, go tell someone. That's when it hit me it may have been stolen. I had learned my first year that insane people have a way with going places they shouldn't be and magically disappearing. It's our job to make sure they don't disappear out of the asylum into public. But this, a knife, it could be deadly. I ran outside locking the door behind me, in case whoever it was was still in there and ran out to tell someone. The whole place went on lockdown, everyone and everything searched, but we couldn't find the paring knife. At this point, everyone, and I mean E-V-E-R when it was accounted for. We all went into the kitchen and searched no knife. They asked me if I knew for a fact it had gone missing. To prove it I showed them a potato I had peeled that morning with it. We all agreed that was weird, but I'm sure you know that sometimes things can literally disappear into a void. I blamed myself and offered to pay for a new knife and apologized for the inconvenience, but we all agreed that safety of the staff was the most important. Still nervous, I asked for someone to help me in the kitchen, just in case there was an unaccounted for crazy lurking, I don't know, on the ceiling or something. I actually looked up to see if there was something or someone up there. One of the guys felt bad and hung out with me. Probably an hour into it, we were joking I was feeling much better when we went into another lockdown. Over the intercom we heard for everyone to stay where they were and keep the doors locked. That was different. Lockdowns usually meant you do that until the place is cleared. Why the clarification? Me and the guy I was with kept working away when we were done. We were still in a lockdown. I phoned the front desk and a weird voice answered. Insane asylum full of creeps and jeeks. How can we fuck you over today? I looked at the phone and hung it up. I basically thought at this point we were all in trouble. In 1967, we didn't have 911. So I phoned the local police and let them know that I thought the asylum was in a great deal of trouble. We waited in that kitchen for about four hours before a police officer showed up. He asked us to open the door. Me and my friend looked at him strange as if wondering if it was real. We both held knives behind our backs, looking a bit crazy. Then we saw the head doctor blood all over his coat, and he said, let them in boys. We opened the door. So naturally we begged to know what the hell happened. One of the employees had stolen the knife when I was washing some lettuce in the sink. He waited for the all clear, then began opening the cells of the crazy people and trapped all the workers in the closet. One of the insane people stole the paring knife and killed him then went around attacking other insane people. My call saved a lot of lives. Without it, 
and being in that room locked I'm not sure how long those men would have been trapped and how many of the insane would have died by one stupid paring knife. It was a truly terrifying day. The Mumbler Back in 1973 political correctness was non-existent, so we had names for all of our patients. There was one we called the Mumbler because he used to mumble as he walked. He was harmless but some of the things he would say were the most fucked up things you'd ever heard. The way he stood Vincent, it was downright creepy. He had his hands pulled in, like a picture of someone being paranoid wringing his hands constantly, and it was pulled up to his face as he mumbled. He'd walk the halls aimlessly and mumble. The nurses and doctors used to tell us if any of the crazy people made conversation to play along act like we were right there with them in the struggle. When they heard voices, we heard them too. I used to play along sometimes, but I don't work with the true crazy people much, and when the mumbler joined the cooking classes, he was pretty well useless. He stood there and just mumbled. One day, I tried to see if he would join. I walked up to him and realized right away he had soiled his diaper. He smelled absolutely awful. Now don't get me wrong, I cared for these people. That's why I was there. I called a nurse and out loud said he shit himself. Most of the time these crazies know they are crazy and don't care when you say stuff like that or more than likely are totally oblivious altogether. This guy screamed so loud it was ear piercing. Shit, 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 I shit, I shit. This scared the others, he kept repeating it over and over. The nurses gave me a mean look and took him away screeching in the halls how he shit himself. I knew this was one of those guys that was probably found painting the walls of his house with his own feces. I didn't think anything about him other than how weird he was. Crazy people are crazy and yes, it was out of the ordinary but not really when you consider the experiments these people went through. He never came back to class after that. Six months later, I was walking the halls and saw him again, without a nurse. I figured he had gotten out. I asked him where he was supposed to be. Even though you know for a fact, a crazy person isn't dangerous, you still need to make sure you don't just walk up to them and grab them. I knew this after years of getting attacked by them. I kept my distance, and he didn't respond, he just mumbled. I listened to him, and I could make out this. Mama, I killed Mama. Daddy, I killed him too. Jerry, he hurt me first, he had to die. But Sissy, why did I kill Sissy? My heart skipped a beat. I realized he was counting on his hands. When he got to his sister, it was like he was actually wondering why he killed her. I kept listening. Wife, you leaked red. Why did you do that? Baby, your head was full of worms and gum. I had to let them out. I had to eat them so you would be safe. I wasn't sure how to handle the situation, but I was pretty sure the mumbler was a guy who snapped killed his whole family, and it turned his brain into mush. I looked at him and said, Harold, buddy, let's go see the nurses. He looked at me with black beady eyes. His hand stopped moving because he stopped counting. My heart started racing. He looked at me and said, why do I kill? When will the voices stop? Like I said before, the nurses always said play along. Harold, what are the voices saying? God, I knew this was a loaded question. Kill, they always want me to kill, kill people. They told me we are all trapped, Bill. He grabbed his skin when he said trapped. This guy was being told we are trapped in our bodies and when we die, we are released. I don't think he was trying to discuss philosophy with me. My heart started racing more. His hands went to his sides. He had no weapon, but he could still attack me. I had to think on my feet how to distract him and get the nurse's attention without escalating the situation. Harold, let's tell the voices together to shut up. I suggested. He nodded. 
Let's yell. Ready, one, two, three together. We scream shut up for about 10 seconds. The nurses came running and they took him and detained him. He immediately began struggling as they were so rough with him. He repeated shut up over and over then he just screamed over and over. They put him in a straight jacket and hauled him off into his room. I obviously needed to write a statement for the incident. I let the doctors know what I did. And the head doctor praised me and said I handled that very well. Never ever approach a crazy person with the idea they are going to be calm and collected just because they've been through therapy. The doctor closed his door behind me and asked me to sit down. Do you know why he is here? He asked. Of course I didn't. And I told him. He was normal like you and I, but when he came back from Vietnam his mind never left the war. One day he just snapped. He started screaming and killed his entire family. He looked at me and paused. I knew there was more. They found him, Bill, eating the brains of his child, his baby Bill. I looked wide-eyed at him and said, what the fuck? I said, remember how talked about worms in the head of his baby? He turned around and looked out the window. War is tragic. He is one of those people we can't help. We can't kill him. So he sits in the hospital heavily sedated counting the people he's killed. I'm not sure how he got out, but if he is ever unattended or given a weapon, I don't know what he will do. He grabbed a pen off his desk and toyed with it for a bit. Bill, sometimes I wonder if we'll end up like him. One day you're a normal guy. The next you're a psychopath walking the halls of an asylum defecating yourself and counting all the people you've killed. Sometimes I wonder. He paused for a minute. If they are just better off dead. I looked at him strange. No, Doc, you and I are sane. I think there's more than just trauma at play. He's probably genetically unstable. You and I won't end up like that and they are worth helping. I always felt like I needed to be the voice of reason. Asylums were for the better. If nothing else, it kept the crazies off the street. He leaned in on his table and looked me square in the eye. Bill, the reason we keep people like him here isn't to help them. It's to study the brain and prevent others from become like that. He pointed off to the side. This hit home to me. He was right. Only a few of us there actually cared about the truly insane ones. Vincent, it still makes me sick to think that that doctor thought that low of those people. A vet who went crazy, now shitting his pants every single day. And that doctor just saw him as a science experiment. What the hell? The Rocker. One of the most unnerving crazies was one we called The Rocker. This was in 1965 when during my first few years. Some mentally ill people tend to rock back and forth pretty often especially after therapy. Some even rocked in the middle of their sleep. The rocker though was called the rocker because when he got one ounce of stress in his blood he would freeze like a statue. In the kitchen one day I was two years in and still feeling hopeful that the kitchen would help all these guys recover and be normal again, even the more insane ones like the rocker. The rocker started grabbing red pepper flakes and tossing them in random dishes. This was making the others kind of mad, and the stress level went up. I told the rocker to stop and go sit down. That's when he literally froze. I've never seen anyone, anything living freeze like that. All of a sudden, he started breathing again, but he was still frozen, his eyes stone cold staring at me I wondered if he was conscious. The nurses came in and picked him up completely frozen and moved him to an area away from the others. I walked over to one and asked her what the hell just happened. They said the shock therapy had messed his nerves up so bad. When he was stressed he acts like he's getting shocked. He tenses up doesn't breath and passes out but his nerves still fire 
and he gets stuck until he wakes back up and his nerves calm. This freaked me out. I asked the nurses how in the world can you deal with a person who every time he gets stressed freezes up. They told me that I couldn't tell him he was doing anything wrong. That went against everything in me. How are you going to teach an insane person how to recover if you baby them? I told them that I didn't think he was cut out for the program if he couldn't follow the rules and couldn't handle being reprimanded. Looking back I feel like I was such a dick, but I was new and had this idea that mentally ill could somehow be cured with mix of kindness and discipline. I then, like a fool, talked with his doctor about moving him to a different therapy. This is how the conversation went. Doctor, I think you need to switch his therapy. He freezes up whenever he gets stressed. You conditioned him. Isn't there something else we can do for him? The doctor was looking at a file. He didn't put it down. He just kept reading and said, Bill, do you even know why he is here? Do you know why we are still treating him? I paused and realized I wasn't the doctor. It kind of hit home. I was in this doctor's office telling him how to do his job and thinking he would listen to me. No, I'm sorry I just... He cut me off. This is a man who was, key word was, a psychopath. He was able to look around a room, locate all exits and weapons, who was able to take him, who was able to hurt him, who he could kill first in a matter of seconds. So we conditioned him to freeze up during stress, and now he is cured. I understand if you don't want him in class, but we can't switch his therapy. I don't want him going back to his killer instincts. The therapy is working. I looked at him with wide eyes. It was like he knew it was wrong, but didn't want to admit it because the guy wasn't hurting anyone. With all due respect, he's not cured. He's a psychopath who seizes up every time. He thinks the word kill. The doctor put down his folder. What do you want me to do, Bill? He killed, and killed, and killed. Finally, they caught him. He was sent here to be cured and monitored. I was getting so angry, but I didn't want to lose my job, and I wisely shut up. It's a success story, Bill. We are able to turn monsters away from killing. If we can perfect it without the seizing, we might put prisons out of business. Just. Relax. I was so furious at this point. Relax. Relax. How did he get off taking crazy people and numbing their minds to mush just to save them? The story's not over though. The next day I asked to talk with the rocker. I told the nurses I was going to apologize and let him know it wasn't him I was angry at just the situation. I was young, so naive I went in and sat on his bed with him. He just looked over at me and his eyes began to twitch a look of anger coming across his face. Listen I know you're getting therapy. I just want you to know that I understand you are mentally cognizant and I just wanted to apologize for earlier. I looked at him his eyes. His hands moved to my neck with lightning speed and he seized his fingers around my neck. I could not breath. I tried to yell, but I couldn't so I just started gurgling on my own spit. I thought, my God, I'm going to die right here in this fucking cell. I saw in his eyes anger, hate. In came the nurses. I started seeing stars. I started fading. I saw them trying to move his arms, but they couldn't and then everything went black. I woke up laying in a hospital bed, a huge gash in my arm sewn up. I asked what had happened and the nurse said, the rocker couldn't physically let go so one of the nurses ran and grabbed a fire axe and she cut the guy's hands off. In the frantic rush, she also sliced through and got me in the arm. When I was got back two weeks later, I found him walking the halls no hands. When he saw me he seized up. It was at this point they realized they couldn't let him be there anymore. He was too stressed out by seeing me so they moved him to another asylum. That was the day I learned to never to assume a psychopath is safe. 
Even after he's had therapy, I saw in his eyes hate. I wasn't sure if it was for me or the system. Was that guy a monster? No, but he did kill people. It was our job to turn them back into people again. Shock therapy wasn't making him less of a psychopath, it was making him a tame psychopath. I know it sounds like I'm saying he's an animal, but I'm not sure how else to put it. He killed without remorse, I don't know what to call that, but I still had hope for him, and I suppose still do, just from a distance. The one thing I could never figure out is why the rocker put the red pepper flakes in the food. I just have to wonder if he realized it was the only way he could cause pain to people without stressing himself out. Since he wouldn't talk I probably will never know. I think if I was to go in his head his thoughts would be, fuck this place, fuck these people, fuck this life. And that Vincent is a dangerous place to be in. Psychopaths are very different from people like the mumbler. They are so sick we don't even know how to fix them. The mumbler can be talked to. He can be told not to listen to the voices even medicated. A psychopath just does. Without feeling or emotion. He would have killed me and not thought of why. He doesn't count his killers because he probably doesn't remember them nor does he care. I wish I knew how to help those people. The time I almost got fired. It was June 5, 1974, a rainy summer by all accounts, or it seemed that way. Me and your aunt had just renewed our vows and fallen deeply in love again. It was a renewing of our faith in God that helped us come together. We both joined a local church and felt great about life. Things were going so well for us. We had just bought a three-bedroom house enough room for both our kids. The U.S. wasn't doing as well. In response to the energy crisis, a 55 miles per hour speed limit had been imposed and daylight savings was extended. Global recession was causing an uprising in patients at the asylum people wanting to get rid of their children or people collapsing under the pressures of the world. Me and your aunt were doing well. The kids were in school, so your aunt got a part-time job working at a library making a good wage. The two incomes were keeping us very well off in that dark time, but I felt always in darkness at the asylum, especially that year. In 1974, the head doctor of the autism unit made an announcement that he believed diet was the proper way to respond to autism. He felt that what the kids ate made them antisocial and stunned them developmentally. He began to do what he called a test treatment. It was more a human experiment. He told me that some kids should eat all veggies, some kids should eat all meat, some kids would have no limit, and one would have to eat only water. A child named Ashley. Each child was given a pill. According to the doctor, it had some sort of medicine that was supposed to give each child exactly what they needed for nutrients. A vitamin, basically. Something was sketchy on all accounts with it. I didn't like it at all, but I had my orders, and it was only supposed to last a week. Two and a half weeks later, I was seeing no change, except in weight. It wasn't my job to do anything but cook but the autistic kids were my kids. I loved them. They were different and picked on for no reason. So what if they didn't talk much? They were brilliant. The doctor described them as unfeeling, childish, recluses. The one who they starved, Ashley, in two and a half weeks was almost skin and bones. Her beautiful blue eyes always captivated me. For the last two weeks, I couldn't look at her. She cooked in class and grew weaker and weaker until she stopped feeling at all. She would sit in the corner unresponsive to the nurse's commands to go. They, one day, asked me if I wanted her in the class anymore due to her behavior. That's when it hit me. I just want to interject here. At this point, my uncle literally broke down. He felt so guilty he hadn't done something sooner. This really affected him we had to stop for a bit get a glass of water to begin again. 
I marched over into the doctor's office and told him he needed to stop the experiment. He looked at me odd. What experiment, Bill? I looked at him with a dirty look and leaned in on his table. I was furious. You know damn well what I mean. Your goddamn treatment is killing those kids. I was shaking with rage, and he could tell. Have you noticed the changes in them? I have. They are improving. I saw one the other day interacting with one of the other kids. My fists clenched, I thought, right there, and then I could have snapped his neck. I felt the insanity that many of the patients felt, but I stopped myself. Killing him wouldn't cure the kids. He had no understanding of what autism was like, I did. He may have read a thousand books on the subject, but I saw them every day. I ran out and looked for Ashley. I found her in her room. I looked around to see if any nurses were around to stop me. None then I opened the door and took her by the hand telling her we were going on a little adventure. I stopped and smiled at her. She was only 13, and she looked at me with eyes so helpless. Ashley, we are going to help you, okay? There will be yelling, but you and I both know you need help right now, okay? I explained to her as best I could, and she nodded slowly. My heart broke, but I had no time for tears. I pulled her with me all the way to the doctor's office. He stared at me. What now? He demanded seeing me. I pulled Ashley in front of me. I held her bony arm up and yelled, Is this what you call treatment? Ashley began to cry. She choked a bit, tears rolling down her face. Oh look, emotion. I guess it's working doctor. Won't be working for long though because if she doesn't get food she going to fucking die. I slammed my hands on the table and looked at him square in the eyes. His eyes were so wide, I thought he was going to fire me right there and then. I didn't care though. Ashley's life was important. The doctor began to stutter. I, I, I now Bill, the expert, treatment is going to be over tonight. Tomorrow we will return the kids to their normal diet. I looked at him and leaned in close. Feed her now. I said between clenched teeth. I'm sure my face was red. Nurses broke in at this time, seeing what was going on and seeing Ashley crying. They went in to console her. They thought I was saying to take her out of my class. The doctor held his hand up and relented. Fine, fine. Nurses get her a cup of chicken broth. I felt better and said, thank you. Holding my hands up then left the room. I was promptly taken into the head doctor's office and told to not mess with the treatments. I told him Ashley was an exception, and if I ever saw a patient that was withering away or dying, I would help them if I could. The head doctor agreed that in this case it could be forgiven, but to be careful how I intervene. For Ashley, however, it was too late. She never recovered, mostly because they never gave her what she needed. She died, a week after the treatment ended for her. The doctor in charge of her was never charged for her death, never even reprimanded. They put her body in the morgue. Her family had abandoned her, so I told the mortician I would purchase a spot for her in a graveyard. I had a small ceremony with a few of the nurses and my colleges who cared as I did. I don't think I ever sobbed so much over a patient. Ashley was a beautiful little girl. She never deserved this. She had so much hope. She was doing so well before. She would smile and laugh during class. She was interacting with others she trusted. Her anxiety was down since she came in. She was learning to live in the big world alongside her autism. I told the head doctor that I should be consulted about students' well-being as I spent every day with them. I told them the nurses should too. They didn't listen. Food treatments were regulated. You could not starve a patient, and a nutritionist was put on staff that needed to be checked before treatment to see if they could withstand the treatment. I will never forget Ashley. Autistic kids are misunderstood. 
They need love and compassion. Just because they're silent doesn't mean they don't feel. When they know you, they open up, and you can help them through tough situations. She should have never been in that asylum. She should have been in a loving family, gone to school, and grown up to be a successful person. Sure, some of them can't speak, but they still feel as well as you or I. C-section. I told you a lot about men in my stories. I'll tell you a story about a woman. I'm not sure what she had for an issue, but this event scared me. I was leaving for the day when I heard a huge commotion. There are times when you know it's just someone having an outburst, and there are other times you know there is something seriously wrong. I rushed over to see what it was. A woman screaming in a corner surrounded by ten people, some nurses, some doctors, all of them keeping their distance because the woman had a knife. Get back. Get back from my baby. She held the knife in her hand pointing it all around her. Her voice sounded deep like a man. Oh God, it's coming. Get a nurse. The knife went down and she put her hand on her stomach this time the voice was almost sweet. The nurses tried closing in but the man voice came back the knife went back up. You motherfuckers come any closer I will gut all of you. The sweet voice came back. It won't come out. It won't come out I need help. The knife turned to her stomach and she slid it in. Moving it in a horizontal line, she bleed through her dress immediately. For a few seconds she screamed but began pulling her intestines out. Then she yelled, Where's the baby? A scream like I have never heard came out of her. Then she passed out slamming her head hard on the floor making the thunk. I had seen a lot by this time in 1979, but this gripped my stomach like a vice. I ran to a nearby trash can we kept in the halls and threw up. The nurses and a doctor got a gurney and put her on it rushing her away. One of the doctors passed by me and asked if I was alright. I shook my head no. What the fuck was that? I said tears coming down my eyes. I'm not sure if it was from me vomiting or from what I had just saw. The doctor looked down at his own hands. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm okay either. I wasn't sure why he was looking at his hands. What did you do? I thought maybe it was guilt that caused him to look down. I don't know why he told me, but he did. LSD. I thought if she saw the people in her visions, she could fight them away. I thought it was subconscious, that she could be cured. Oh God, what have I done? I wasn't sure what to do at this point, so I walked away. I think oftentimes these doctors don't know what it's like to be out of their office. They do treatments, but never really see the results as they happen. I'm not sure what happened to the girl. She wasn't in my class, and I wasn't about to go find out either. The doctor, though, went home, and that week he hung himself. I'm not sure if he had other things tormenting him in his life, but maybe nothing he did was working, and he finally felt the pressure of failure. Nothing was more telling than watching a woman gut herself alive and it was all because of you. But I began to wonder how she got the knife. I knew there was more to the story, but I couldn't investigate like days gone by. I needed to be on my best behavior. I attended the doctor's service. The priest reminded us that mental illness affects everyone, not just those who are in the hospital, but those who are helping others in the hospital. I wanted to get up and preach from the pulpit about what was really going on, how that doctor wasn't treating the girl, and how he thought LSD was going to cure someone. I shook my head biting my tongue. Who gives LSD to a mental patient? I kept having nightmares of the girl, cutting herself open, pulling it out. It was a reoccurring dream that I couldn't get out of my mind. I had to visit the pastor and have him pray for me five times before I finally got it out of my mind. I just don't understand what that doctor was thinking. After that day, I began hating that place. Not the patients, but being there. The head doctor, who had been my friend in college, 
and was how I got the job, was going to be leaving. My head was on the chopping block as far as a job was concerned, and I couldn't just intervene for the patients anymore. I wanted out but I wasn't sure where I would go. I had been here for over 15 years. Where could I go? I wasn't ready to retire. I knew it was useless trying to quit so I stuck with it at least for another few years. Appendix. I want to mention again that you should consider donating to mental health organizations you trust. It may be a charity devoted to just supporting people in your community or one dedicated to ending mental disorders. Both can have huge impact when we raise awareness. So this one was short. Please let me know what you want to hear about next. My uncle has a story about one night when he was working late and he had a paranormal experience. And also he has a story about being stalked by someone outside of the hospital. One other story I could tell is the one about the screamer. That one was freaky, but I kind of want to save that one for another day. Let me know what you would like to hear next. Stalked. When I first started the job, I lived fairly close to the asylum. I used to walk there every day instead of taking the car, until that day. I left for the day, and it was in the middle of winter. I was cold, and I bundled up for the hour-long walk. It was dark by 6 p.m. now, but I was excited to get home after a long day of work. I always enjoyed the walks I could think about the day and get it off my mind before I got home. It helped to pressurize me from the craziness of the day. Today was a day like any other. I said goodbye clocked out and then left the asylum. When I got to the streets, I immediately noticed someone behind me. Obviously, this is not that unusual, except they were walking pretty fast and seemed pretty annoyed. Hey, hey you. I heard from behind. I stopped and turned around. He wore a black bandana around his head, sunglasses like John Lennon's eyeglasses, a white t-shirt under a leather jacket unbuttoned over his shirt and blue jeans. His finger was pointed in my face. I seen you come out of that place. You think it's fucking cool to torture God's children. I went into work mode and decided it was best to play along. God how if only cell phones were invented back in 1968. I don't. I hate it there, but they are making me work there. His finger dropped and he looked at me oddly. I leaned in. You gotta help me, man. You should go tell the police what they're doing. He laughed and put his arm around my shoulder, total change in attitude. Tried. The police don't want to help us. We gotta do this ourselves. He reached into the back of his jeans and pulled out a gun. You and I, we can do this right now. Free you. Free every one of the children. My eyes got wide. I didn't know what to do now. I thought of my wife. I thought of what to do next. If I said the wrong thing, I might end up shot right here in the snow. No, let me go home and get my gun. Then we can meet back here in about two hours, when it's darker and there's only security around. I was panicking hoping this worked. It did. He laughed and said, right on brother, go home get your gun and meet back here. He winked at me and walked the other way muttering something. I ran as hard as I could to the police station and let them know what had just happened. They went to the location and couldn't find him. Meanwhile, I went home and told my wife what had happened. I got my gun out and slept with it near me. That night I heard a tap on the window. I grabbed my gun and looked out it carefully. It was that same guy. Where the fuck were you? He yelled waving his gun around. I closed the window and ran to the phone calling the police and telling them I needed them now. They said they would be there as soon as they could. I peeked out the window and he was gone. I was terrified. They wouldn't find him and he would be back. When the police came they looked around and couldn't find him. I told them what he looked like 
and they said they would have a patrol car roam the area throughout the night. I didn't feel any safer. The next day, I drove to the asylum and your aunt stayed at a friend's for the day. When I got in, I immediately reported that there was a man who wanted to get in and he had a gun. They called in for some extra security and they kept an eye out for the man. He didn't show up. I felt a little better knowing he wasn't around. Maybe I'd be fine. The day was as normal as it can be in the asylum. People screaming in the halls. Someone started a fight with another patient. There was babbling and someone even yelled out that Satan's four archdemons were after him as he ran from the nurses. I thought it was ironic. Because sometimes I felt like the nurses really were Satan's demons. After my shift I left and I picked up your aunt. And then we went home. Immediately I locked the doors and felt paranoid for what was inside. I walked through the house carefully checking every room looking underneath furniture and in closets I was too terrified to check outside. I felt it was clear but in a few minutes came a tap on the window and a scream from my wife. I ran down the stairs and pointed my gun out the window. Come on Bill, it's me Jerry. I tried to rack my brain for who Jerry was. I remember he was a crazy lunatic they thought was cured after giving him some sort of hydrotherapy. He showed me his arms they were cut from the elbow down with little marks. I kept cutting until the therapy wore off. The voices are just too strong, Bill. They know what needs to be done. I have to set them free, Bill. You know just as well as I do. I cocked the gun. Jerry, I will shoot you if you come any closer to the house. You are not welcome here. You are sick, go back to the doctors. Meanwhile, my wife had called the cops, and they were on their way. I knew it. He sighed and pulled out his gun. I knew you were with them. He pointed his gun at me. The thing is, Bill, I can't die. I'm a fucking god. I was sent by Odin. I'm Thor's twin. If I cock my gun. He cocked it. And I pointed to my brain like this. He pushed the gun up to his head. Don't do it, Jerry. You're not right. Put the gun down. I could hear sirens in the distance. Bill, I swear I can't die. Watch and be amazed. He pulled the trigger and blew his brains out. Your aunt screamed, and I stared in disbelief. The guy really honestly thought he was invulnerable, and he was some sort of someone chosen by God to free the people in the asylum. It was all a blur. Like slow motion, I watched him fall to the ground. I turned and held my wife as blue and red lights came up the driveway police with guns drawn running all around the house. I opened the door and the police got there and took my statement. I was in total shock at what I had just seen. It just highlights to me how therapy like hydro and shock doesn't really work. People can't just be magically cured with some sort of conditioning. Jerry is a product of someone who couldn't act on the voices he heard, but he still heard them. No conditioning could change that. When he got out he probably felt good, like he could not do evil. The truth was, he probably started cutting to try to quiet the voices, and when he cut he pushed through what the therapy had conditioned him to feel. I wish Jerry could have gotten help. Sometimes, there's nothing you can do, because it's already too late. The Screamer. I'll be honest, I have a huge heart for the insane, but the screaming is what always got on my nerves. When I walked the halls before leaving all you could hear was screaming. People would scream in the day too. There was one guy who we called the Screamer, because he was a special kind of Screamer. He scared me because I'm pretty sure he wasn't mentally ill. I think he was a real honest guy. And now he was stuck. I wanted to release him, but I couldn't. When he first came and everyone noticed because he struggled hard, he wouldn't go in the room and he flopped everywhere screaming as loud as he could. I didn't kill her. Let me go. I don't need to be in here. This wasn't too uncommon. 
Sometimes people who had schizophrenia were pretty normal people and would mention how they didn't do what they were sent here for. Worse yet were the multiple personality people who would say they didn't the other person did. I wrote it off as just a normal thing. One night when I was walking the halls I stumbled upon his room. He was laying on his bed mumbling to himself. I looked in the window and saw him knelt down with rosary beads. He was praying. This really tipped me off. Not that insane people can't pray, but something hit me when I saw it, like God was telling me this poor soul didn't belong here. When he looked up and saw me he rushed over and started to scream. Let me out, please. I don't belong here. I put my finger to my lips but he was in hysteria. I couldn't reason with him and by now the nurses had rushed in. I walked away and went home. I told your aunt about it and she felt deep down that I was right. This guy didn't belong there. I wasn't sure if I really could go snooping around but I felt like I had to do something for this poor guy. The next day I walked in early at four in the morning. I walked in and could hear the screams and moans from the patients who were troubled. I walked to the guy's cell and looked everywhere. It's hard to sneak around these places when there's noises all around. I grabbed his file and looked at it quickly. He was charged with murder, found with a gun and his dead wife. His arms were cut it said, and he was in hysterics. He was a Vietnam vet. I couldn't find any more and I heard a door close I shoved the file back into the file holder and thought for a second. I figured he was a vet who was framed and had a bit of mental issues. In my gut, I knew he didn't kill his wife. I thought of how in the world I could get in the cell with him and just chat. I went to the kitchen and cooked up food when I heard there was a lockdown. It took about 20 minutes. When I went outside to see what it was about after the lockdown, all I could hear was screaming from that guy. Unintelligible screaming. I ran down to see what he was saying. The man was literally going insane just being here. I can't fucking take it. Kill me, you Kongs. Kill me. He let out a horrifying ear-piercing screech I had never heard from a man. I left Nam four years ago. Let me go. I'm a vet. Tears well up in my eyes. What could I do? I didn't want to give him false hope by telling him I was his savior here to release him. I couldn't I be fired for sure. I went back to the kitchen to do my work, but all I could think about was him. That night before I left I went to his cell and looked inside. He wasn't there. He was in treatments. For the next four months the treatments only made him worse. He started believing he was being tortured. He literally began spouting off codes of something. I think they were classified information. He started begging to be let out, crying, and asking why they were doing this to him. I decided to look at his file one night quickly again. They had tried everything for the guy. Everything was marked with a Treatment made patient worse. Uppers and downers. Shock and hydro. There was one treatment circled. Lobotomy. My heart sank. I hated lobotomies. They worked, and they worked too well. Stripping a man of his emotions just so he would be cured. My heart raced. I thought now or never. I fumbled through my keys to the master key we all had in case we witnessed a man freaking out in his room. I stopped myself though. Was one man worth my job? I struggled for literally five minutes on what to do. I wish I could say I released him right there, but I took him home, gave him hot soup, and kept him for the next year to help him really recover. I didn't. I walked away from that cell tears flowing from my eyes knowing that the screamer wouldn't scream after tomorrow. The next day I cut up the food early in the morning. When I got in I heard his screaming. When I left I heard not one peep from his cell. I looked in and he was silent. Sitting on his bed staring. He looked over to me his eyes were lifeless. His bony hand lifted and waved slowly. 
It was as if I could hear a creaking cog coming from it. He was now a robot. I heard him mumble. I'm better now. He kept saying it over again as he moved his hand. I backed away from the window and walked home. I hit my head over and over on the way out saying, Wake up. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a fucking dream this was real. I called out the next day and took a day off with your aunt we all went to the beach. I did that after a traumatic day. This one was too much. That night I had a dream of him. He was screaming at me and pointing saying, How could you leave me? I'm trapped inside this body. I can't escape now. I woke up feeling guilty, and to this day I still do. It was messed up, I know. It's not my fault, I know that. I just can't stop thinking about how that man was innocent. I don't have proof, but I swear he was innocent. I just can't get that last vision out of my mind. His hand waving slowly and robotically, and him just repeating. I'm better now. I'm better now. The covered door. The mumbler's story doesn't have a very good ending. I'd like to tell you he lived happily ever after in his crazy world, but that's not true. Every insane person has his end point, because they need to be cured at any cost. How do you prove to the community that the criminally insane is cured though? No one wants a reformed murderer living down the street. For the mumbler, the doctors had thought for a while about everything and decided to give him a new and very experimental pill. It was supposed to erase memories. The idea was that the mumbler could erase his memory of the war and what he had done. As he recovered, they would slowly explain what had happened in the past years of memory that was lost, letting him recover slowly and learn he was reformed now. We all knew about it, because we all had different opinions. Some said it was good for science, some said it was inhuman to remove memories, others argued it was a revolutionary treatment if it worked. The medication was given to the mumbler, and we all began checking on him to find out if it was working. Things seemed promising at first. We were all shocked when he began to act normal. He stopped mumbling and counting the people he killed. It was incredible. There was something wrong though, I could tell. When his doctor stopped the drug, he seemed normal, but was asking all kinds of questions. Where he was, why he was here. The man was honestly scared for his life. His doctor brought him behind closed doors every day and talked with him. We didn't know what he was being talked to about. One day, he showed up in my class. He was put back in my program. After the meal was prepared, I sat down and ate with him and talked to him about what happened. I asked him what the last thing he remembered was. I was in a trench, V Kongs were shooting at me, and I got shot. I guess I lived, but the doc said I recovered and only just recently remembered who I was. In these situations, you don't want to tell the guys what really happened. It would be like waking up and hearing no one around you is real. It's all fake like The Truman Show. Hmm. Well, you must be glad you're home then. He looked at me and looked around then leaned in. Did Jester just jump the candle? I looked at him very, very odd. I knew something was still off about this guy. Ah. Uh? What? No, who's the jester? He gave me a dirty look and sat back. I immediately drew conclusions. That was military code, I was sure of it, and I thought this guy thought he was still back in the war. After the dinner, I went to his doctor and told him the conversation. I explained that the guy was probably still screwed up and needed further treatment of some kind to help him realize he wasn't in the war. The doctor ignored me and expressed his annoyance that I would make conversation with him about the war. Why would you bring that up? He yelled standing up out of his chair. I didn't bring it up. He did. I thought he was cured. I defended myself. This is delicate research, Bill. 
Leave it be. He pushed me out of the door and shut it. I was pissed as I left. There had to be more to the story. There was going to be a big breakdown if I didn't do something. My hands were tied though, so I did the only thing I could do. I educated myself. When I got home, I decided to call into a detective uh, I was become friends with. I asked him who this guy was in the military. Corporal Harold, last name. He was a highly decorated soldier, but also a Marine. He had been trained specially to kill, and apparently had been pretty good at it. Bill, I mean this, watch your back around this guy. He can kill with his bare hands. He doesn't need weapons. My friend was right. I had seen him doing push-ups in his room at night before bed. This guy was more crazy than ever before. His psychosis that had kept him controlled was gone now. He was a killing machine again. Let's hope he forgot how to do any of that. I said we both said our goodbyes, and I began to think it over. Should I quit? For my safety. I just knew it was a matter of time before something bad happened. This was a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. I decided to stick it out and hope for the best. For months I watched him. He was growing stronger and stronger each day. In the kitchen he would cook with precision looking around at everyone else like he was assessing the situation. He was fooling the doctors. He was showing them one side of him, but I could see his real side. The doctors were too blind to see the truth because they were obsessed with their drug working wonders. One night, as I was leaving he came up to me in the hall and asked if we could talk for a second. He put his arm around me and began to whisper. They told me what I did today. I like you Bill. I know I can trust you. How about you take tomorrow off? I looked over at him with eyes wide. His grip around my neck tightened and he walked me out the door. I almost couldn't breath, but I got his point. I nodded, and he pulled back massaging my shoulders for a quick second before patting my back as I walked away. Awesome. Have a good night. The security let me out of the door. I could see the guy watching from behind. I looked at the security officer and moved my head slightly to show him that he should follow me out. He followed and when we were out of sight I got dead serious. That guy is fucking insane. He's going to kill people tomorrow. You have to stop him. Where are his nurses? Why is he walking alone? The security guard thought I had finally cracked. He grabbed my by the shoulders and shook me a bit. Bill, it's okay. He's in recovery. He can walk the halls before curfew. Relax. I shook my head and pulled away. Listen to me, God damn it. He thinks he's still in Nam. You and I are just soldiers to him. He's going to murder someone if we don't keep an eye on him. I took a long breath and paced back and forth. I could tell the security guard was taking me serious now. He told me to take tomorrow off. He said the doctors told him what he had done. That means soon he will be released probably, but he doesn't know that. He thinks this is a goddamn prison camp. It was coming clear to the guard now. Okay, Bill, I'll step up security tomorrow and let someone know. I took a breath and walked home feeling better. Not for the guy, but for the workers. The next day, I went to the beach with the family, and we all had a great time. I almost forgot that I something was going to happen at work. When I got home work entered my mind. I couldn't sleep that night. I was wondering what happened and could not wait to get up and learn. I was hoping no one was dead. I was hoping that, as sick as this sounds, Harold was just planning on committing suicide. At least then no one else was hurt. The truth was just hours away. I got up around 3 a.m. not able to take it anymore. I showered, ate breakfast and put cloths on. I waited on the couch, shaking my leg from the nerves and coffee. I felt like the times your aunt was giving birth, sitting in the waiting room wondering if everything was okay. 
As soon as it was late enough to leave and go to work, I rushed over. I got in and heard, and very air silence. I've told you how there are always screams. There weren't today. I slowly made my way down the hall to Harold's former room. The window was cardboarded off, but I could smell blood from inside. There was a clear blood stain outside of his door. Oh God, Harold, what have you done? I whispered, and I instantly pulled out my master key, but heard from down the hall. Bill, don't. You can't go in there. It was the security guard. He walked towards me, gun out and pointed at me. I dropped my keys. Whoa, let's calm down. I said he drew closer and grabbed my keys. Then he put his gun back. They're very serious about not going in there. I don't mean to alarm you, but it's being investigated by the police. I looked at the room then back at him. What the fuck happened? Why would you point a gun at me? I asked. Harold faked a seizure when the doctor came in with the nurses to check him and possibly adjust a dosage of some of his medication. He grabbed the doctor and broke his neck. The nurses tried to restrain him, but he started beating them all. Security was called, but when we got here, the door was closed. When we broke it open, we found he had torn off the faces off the nurses and the doctor. He must have realized they weren't disguises. He charged after one of us even though we told him to stop. So we shot him. I was horrified. I warned the doctor, I told the security. I did everything I could, but it was too late. You can't mess with memories. You can't just erase the bad ones to make it as if it didn't happen. The guy didn't believe the doctor. He thought this entire place was a setup. I bet he thought the patients were all soldiers and that I may have been too. He was a strong man, an honorable soldier. He had fallen from PTSD, but they put him back in the war. The police came and the families of the nurses sued the asylum for not follow proper procedure or something. The asylum's lawyers fought and won the case saying they had followed everything, and this incident was a sad event. But the nurses knew the risks. Life went on as usual. The room was cleaned I'd imagine, but was never used again for some reason. I bet if you went to the hospital you'd find that room, with cardboard still over the window and probably locked. For some reason they never ever opened it again. I think it was a painful reminder to the doctors that they didn't know it all. And they too were just bags of flesh that could be killed too.